This small island in the Aegean Sea was a decisive factor in the outcome of World War II. The island was called Abalone. On July 22, 1943, five gigantic cannons were brought to the island. It wasn't long before they were bombarding every spot on the globe, generally causing a terrible nuisance. What you're about to see is an account of how these fearsome leviathans were silenced. This is the story of the guns of Abalone. Send Captain Schneider in here. I am Captain Schneider, General. Well, you certainly got here fast. Schneider, form a group of commandos and destroy those guns the narrator was talking about. To hear is to obey. Thus came about the formation of Schneider's Raiders. To make a short story even shorter, Schneider's Raiders accomplished what they set out to do. The guns of Avalon were silenced, but not forever. Eighteen years later, a reunion was held on the second floor of a one-store building. Captain Schneider, older and wiser, proposed a toast to his comrades. So drink, chugalug, chugalug, chugalug. So drink, chugalug. Include me out, Captain. What's wrong, Crenshaw? Are you driving tonight? No, it's them headlines in the paper. And there in Black Packer were the words, Guns of Avalon, renew firing. The paper's wrong. The paper was right. A worldwide appeal was launched for volunteers to destroy the cannons once and for all. Alas, not one volunteer stepped forward. Hokey smoke, Bullwinkle, we're out of milk. One of us has got to run down to the store. Leave it to me, Rock. I'll go. Wouldn't you know it, those last two words, I'll go, were overheard by a newspaper reporter who relayed them to his editor, who relayed them to a linotype machine, who relayed them to page one of the Frostbite Falls flyer. Read all about it. Bullwinkle says he'll go. Is it true, Bullwinkle? You're going to Abalone? Oh, I never shop at Abalone's. Too crowded, you know. I always buy my groceries at the J&T. You don't understand, Bullwinkle. Somehow or other, when you said you'd go, everyone assumed you'd volunteer to go to an island in the Aegean Sea. What's wrong with the milk in this country? It took Rocky the better part of the night to explain what had happened. In fact, he was still explaining about a jet airliner bound for Europe. And if those cannons aren't taken care of, they could blow up the world. What's that got to do with the price of milk? We've nothing better to do, so let's jump ahead of our heroes to their eventual destination. Now, the island of Avalon isn't very large, yet the cannons are not easily discernible. That's because they are camouflaged. You see that small building with the five smokestacks? Well, those smokestacks are in reality... Smokestacks. The cannons are on the other side of the island, disguised as trees. Whoops, there they go. Oh, boy, Boris, those things make loud booms. You think this loud? Wait till world gets ransom note. Then you hear noise. I going to say, world, Boris will blow you up unless you give to me moose named Bullwinkle and squirrel named Rocky. For why you let those two bug you? Because, Natasha, I promised someone I rid hemisphere of all goody goodies. For your promise. <laughs> Me. Here, take shell and load number one canyon. Yes, those two near wells, Boris Badanov and Natasha Fatal, were responsible for reactivating the guns of Avalon. Who we aim for this time, darling? Oh, we take Patlock. And the shell arched its way up into the sky, then took off on a straight line for the airplane carrying our heroes. And that's one of the few straight lines in the show. Will it be a direct hit? Will the real Bullwinkle stand up? Don't miss Falling Stars or Only a Plumber Should Plummet. <laughs> It was once thought that taking the long count meant that someone had lost a boxing match. In the kingdom of Withering Heights, however, taking the long count simply meant that the very tall Count Basil had been swindled again. The poor Count was an easy dupe for any charlatan he chanced to meet. Psst. Hey, bud, how would you like to buy a stable of racing chickens? Racing chickens? <laughs> Nobody races chickens. I know. You'll be the only one in the world. That way you'll never lose a race. Say, that's right. <laughs> 
I'll take it. Then again, that same morning... I'll bet you a thousand to one you can't jump over Four Mile Canyon. I'll hold the stakes. Of course, even the Count knew that he couldn't make it, but at a thousand to one, he couldn't resist the odds. <laughs> this went on year after year, and finally, there came a day when the poor Count had nothing left to be swindled out of. His castle was repossessed, his riches were gone, he even had to give up his stable of racing chickens. Oh, I really hate to see those chickens go, especially the trotters. Penniless and in rags, the Count was forced to become a lowly wood chopper so that he could earn enough to buy bread and cheese. A lowly wood breaker, to be exact, old boy. You see, I can't even afford to buy a ruddy oh. axe. Then, one morning, as he was going off through the forest to his daily task, he saw a beautiful bird. A sapsucker, I believe, with one of its wings caught in the branch of a tree. I'm what you might say, a sap and sucker myself. Going to the branch, he released the tiny bird, whereupon it fluttered into the air, circled several times, and then, landing on his head, laid an egg in his hat. And with a cheery song, he flew away into the clouds. I say, how nice. He quickly made a fire and prepared to cook the egg, but, to his amazement, when he opened the egg, a gold coin fell out. By Jove, what a generous and talented bird. It was several days later, while making his usual trip into the woods, that he heard a familiar sound, and there, in the same tree, he saw the same bird caught on the same limb. My word. Once again, he released the bird, and just as before, it fluttered into the air, circled several times, landed on his head, laid an egg in his hat, and flew off into the sky. Quickly taking the egg, the Count broke it open, and this time, two gold coins fell out. Champion! A double yoker! Thank heaven for little birds! The Count had two gold coins, but not for long. Less than two hours later, a fast-talking rogue had the coins, and the Count had a deed to the Atlantic Ocean. Now, well, don't laugh. This might turn out to be a good investment someday. Well, back to the tree. Yes, but when he arrived, the little bird was not there. I wonder what could be keeping the little beggar. Oh, yes, here he is. And this time, the Count was taking no chances. Instead of setting the bird free, he took it with him. I shall never let you out of my sight again. And for the next six months, the bird laid eggs in the hat, and the Count counted coins. One million and two, one million and three, one million and four, one million and... What's this? An Indian had penny? Ooh! See, here we'll have none of that. The marvelous little bird was able to lay eggs full of gold coins faster than the Count could be swindled out of them. So, it was no time at all before the Count was richer than he'd ever been before. He was able to buy fine castles. I'll take two. They're small. Had all of his clothes made from the most expensive material. Let's see, that's 700 gold shirts, 600 silver sneakles, and 1,000 satin socks, right? And quite. And don't forget the mink middies, okay? He had everything he could wish for. He even bought back his stable of racing chickens. Rich and famous, he was the envy of every fair maiden in the kingdom, and, choosing the fairest and the most beautiful of all, he was married. Dearest, I have a gift for you. Oh, how nice. What is it? The thing I treasure most, me. <laughs> no, seriously, this tiny bird to whom I owe everything. A sap sucker. Oh, how nice. <laughs> His wife took the bird and was very pleased. It seemed as though the Count was most certainly destined to live happily ever after. But that very afternoon, tragedy struck. Extra! Here, boy. Paper. And when he read the headlines... Snow White eats poison apple. Good grief. What's the matter, mister? You look green. Snow White. She ate the apple. So what? Odds were five to one that she would. I know. But I wagered everything I have in the world that she wouldn't. I've lost everything. I'm wiped out. But remembering that he still had the little bird that laid eggs full of gold coins, he frantically rushed to his wife. <laughs> Dear, you know that little bird I gave you? Yes. How did you like it? Oh, fine. It was delicious. Ooh. Ruined beyond words, the Count went back to the woods and sat under the old tree where he waited and waited for a hundred years. But from that day to this, no one has ever found another sapsucker that laid eggs full of... <coughs> gold coins. Rock. It's also handy for breathing and ornamental purposes. Today, our subject is how to interview a scientist that is working on a secret project. We begin by finding a scientist. 
Without a human subject to work on, the experiment is lost. But who would be stupid enough? Pardon me, sir, but are you a scientist? Point two is to be subtle about getting to the subject of his project. If the project is secret, he may be reluctant to tell you. Are uh, you doing anything interesting lately? Certainly. Sit right here and I'll tell you all about it. Let's see. Say, you mind if I ask you about your personal habits, problems, hobbies, and... Certainly not. I just love to put this electronic ball on Moose's heads. It's a habit, a problem, and a hobby. Fine. Now, what about pets? I'm glad you asked. My pet? Let's just put him here and put a nice ball on his head, just like the one on yours. There. Oh, yes. Is your current project related to the rocket field? No. Is your current project related to the atomic field? No. Well, what's the current then? The current, the current. I want the current. <laughs> Gosh, Mr. Know-it-all, what happened? Now, how will you remember what the scientist is working on? Oh, I can remember, Rock. I'm almost certain it is a brain transfer machine. Eeny, meeny, chilly beeny, the spirits are about to speak. Are they friendly spirits? Friendly? Just listen. A secret project was under construction on the mountain directly above the RCMP camp. And one day, Inspector Fenwick saw a sign that read... Hmm, top secret. That means whatever's going on is a top secret program. Well, no one's going to violate top secret security while I'm Inspector. Send in Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties at once. Dudley Do-Right of the Mounties reporting, sir. Do-Right, undoubtedly you've noticed the activity that's going on directly above our camp. Well, I happen to know that it's top secret. Could you speak up, sir? Top secret, oh. confound you. Do right, keep your ears open. If this project were to be known to certain villainous types, the whole program would be for nothing. What is the project, sir? Uh, I don't know, Dudley. All I know is that it is top secret. Mum's the word, sir. What's the word, Dudley? Uh, Mum, sir. Oh, yes. Well, Dudley, to keep this certain villainous type from finding out about this top secret project... Could you speak up, sir? Top secret project! What top secret project? On the mountain, directly above the RCMP camp, Nell. Dudley, I thought you said Mum's a word. Mum it is, sir. Oh, well, do right. I want you to watch Snidely Whiplash 24 hours a day. Never let him out of your sight, otherwise I am certain you will find out some way of wrecking the project. Yes, sir, Inspector, and remember, Nell, Mum's the word. All right. Mum, Mum, Dudley. Mum, Nell. There you are, sir, all finished. Thank you, Baba. Sorry to keep you waiting, sir. But you don't understand. Hey, impatient, hey? Well, this ain't gonna take long. <laughs> there, now, that didn't take long. Confound it, I've got to keep my eye on that man because mum is the word. There'll be one dollar and twenty cents, please. No tip. That was delicious, waiter. Check, please. A check, sir? What's that? Oh, the check. <laughs> but you see, I must follow that man because... Well, I can't tell you because mum is the word. I see. Mum, huh? Well, I won't tell a soul. Just better check But you and... don't understand. I haven't any money. You are letting Archville and Snidely Whiplash get away. Of course I'm letting him get away. He paid his check. Dudley? Dudley, I don't mind you picking up a little extra money, but not on mounted time. You were supposed to be watching Archville and Snidely Whiplash, not freelancing dishwashing. But, sir... Quick, do right. Follow that man. Is that an order, sir? That's an order, do right. All right, what happened to the guy who couldn't pay his check? Oh, you mean Dudley? Well, he's following his man. Well, that doesn't get the dishes done, now, does it? Uh, dishes? Yeah, somebody gotta finish those dishes to pay for his check. Do you have anyone in mind? Uh, yeah. You! I had a feeling he was going to say that. Dudley Durright followed his man. No underworld dive could hide the elusive Snidely whiplash from the Hawkeye's Hawkeye Durright of the Mounties. Gee, Inspector, where did you get those rough red hands? You should know, Dudley. At least if you don't pay your check, find a restaurant that uses soft detergent. I'm sorry, Inspector. Hmm. Have you been
been keeping an eye on Snidely. He's right over there, Inspector, eating a candied apple. Well, he was over there. Hmm, that's funny. Dudley, if I've washed those 3,041 dishes and you've lost Snidely Whiplash, I'm going to drum you out of the floor. I see him, Inspector. Where is he, Dudley? He's over there by the taffy pole. Well, stick to him, man. Stick to him like glue. And that's exactly what Dudley did. He stuck to Snidely like taffy. Finally, the big day arrived. The top secret project was finished, and at 3 o'clock was to be unveiled. I want to tell you, do right. you've done a splendid job in keeping an eye on Whiplash. I know you'll feel proud when the top secret project is unveiled to know that you had an important part in it. It's three o'clock, sir. Confounded do-right, it's all your fault. How can we function when arch-villain Snidely Whiplash is leering down on us like that? What I can't understand is how he had the time to carve a big face like that. I've been with him all the time. Well, I don't know how he did it, but I know one thing. You are going to climb up there and erase that big face, do-right, and I'm the double. For days and days, Dudley worked on the mountain. And one day, it was finished. Inspector, I did it. Good work, Dudley. Is the face completely erased? Better than that, Inspector. Look! It's pretty hard to get peace and quiet these days, especially with the guns of Abalone spreading destruction all over the place. Someone's got to silence those cannons. Bullwinkle and Rocky were on their way, but it wasn't going to be easy. Unless they send me moose and squirrel, I blow up cotton peaking world. Alas, that shell was aimed directly at our hero's aircraft. Quick, tell the pilot to make a 90 degree turn. Bullwinkle dashed to the pilot's compartment, but the pilot was already aware of the situation and had parachuted to safety. What did he say, Bullwinkle? Not a heck of a lot. Well, if he doesn't make a turn, we're going to get blown up. Prophetic words. Seconds later, all that remained was a black cloud. Ah, but when the cloud broke up, it revealed the wreckage of the plane, and the plane was sitting atop the rock of Gibraltar. It must have hit us just as we landed. We sure are lucky. Some of us are, anyway. Bowwinkle, you're hurt. Oh, it's nothing, Rock. You third-degree burn. The smoldering moose was in need of medical attention, and the only place to get it on Gibraltar was the British Army Hospital. Britons, however, were notoriously healthy on the island, and the hospital had been converted into a billiard parlor. Looks like they're busy operating. Pardon us, gentlemen, but is there a... Hush! Can't you see I'm in the midst of a devilishly ticklish shot? Oh, shoot, Carruthers, you're beaten and you know it. Not if I make this shot, I'm not. Why don't you try putting a little English on the ball, seeing as how you're British and all that? <laughs> Exasperated, General Carruthers looked up just as he shot and neatly stuck his cue through the table. Nice try. Good Lord, that's torn it. You've made me ruin this table. My favorite snooker table, and you've caused me to decimate it. Well, couldn't you play miniature golf on it or something? Gods, gods, place these two under arrest. But you don't understand, sir. I'm burned. And you think I'm not? The boys were unceremoniously <coughs> dumped into a cell. Oh, fine. Now how do we get to Abalone from here? In two words, escape. The walls are two feet thick. There weren't any windows, and the only door is airtight. Well built, isn't it? Seems to be some writing on the floor. Wait till I blow the dust off. <laughs> Can you read what it says? <coughs> Not too well, no. Monte Cristo was here. Hey, do you know what that means? Yeah, some guy was in here making sandwiches. No, the Count of Monte Cristo must have been imprisoned in this cell, and he got out. Said so in the book. How long did it take him? About 200 pages. Well, we better hurry. I think we're on our last chapter. Working feverishly, Rocky and Bullwinkle dug with their hands, attempting to discover a secret passage. Their efforts were soon rewarded. <laughs> that stone swings out. Leave us swing out, too. Into a passage they went, but due to the darkness, there was no way of knowing where it led. Hey, I feel cool air blowing on me. You know what that means? It means I'm breathing down your neck. No, it means that we're approaching the entrance to this tunnel. Oh, shucks. I was hoping it'd be an exit. Bowwinkle, I think we're outside. Well, strike a match for freedom, Rock. And just like that, they were bathed in light.
Those are some matches you have. It wasn't a match, but a row of searchlights that provided the sudden illumination. And beside them stood a firing squad. The penalty for escape is instant liquidation. Sorry. Prepare to volley, chaps. Uh -oh. Is this to be our hero's swan song? Don't miss I'm out of bullets or pour me another shot. Oh.